A rise business analyst, Bodhi Oshasami, is here to take us through the markets as the New York Stock Exchange opens for cash trading. Bodhi, thanks so much for joining us on Newsday. U.S. markets have just opened. We also just got the producer price index, also called the factory gates inflation measure. Can you bring us up to date? Yes, indeed, um, uh, Tokwe, and thanks for having me on the show. U.S. futures, just like you said, they were negative, remained negative after we got the wholesale prices or PPI data. Um, markets opened, so they went slightly into positive in some of the indices, but I can see now that NASDAQ is down 0.74%. Uh, Dow 30 is also down 0.21%. S&P 500 uh, also down 0.47%. Interestingly, all the major European indices are also in negative territory. FTSE 100 is down 1.33%. DAX is down 0.95%. Capron is down 0. 1.2, 1 1.26%, 1 uh, that's uh, Cacaron. And if you look at it from the Italian index, the main index there also, also down. So the big question people ask is, why is sentiment so much in the red? And um, the, the economy and inflation is, is supposedly looking good. And I think the, the answer is that it's perhaps not looking as good as many would have liked uh, uh, it to be. We were actually waiting for this print uh, to clear the fog. Yes, we had a mixed message from the inflation numbers yesterday, the CPI, that is the Consumer Price Index, which looked mixed, especially with comments that came from Fed uh, boss, say, a Fed boss made a daily saying there's still a lot of work uh, to do. But the PPI didn't confirm the, the disinflation narrative. Instead, uh, we saw uh, PPI ticking up, and they're not enough to move the needle. Everybody expected, well, I expected an upside surprise. We are getting higher wage growth, higher energy and transport costs. Uh, you would expect also prices to go up. So it did go up, but um, it didn't go up very uh, aggressively. The PPI and the core PPI both rose on a monthly basis 0.3% higher than 0.2% month and month expected for, for July. PPI rose 0.1% on an annual basis in June. Expect, uh, analysts expected 0.7% um, in uh, July, but it went up to 0.8%. The annual core PPI increased 2.4% in July, matching June's uh, reading. PPI is important because it's predictive of future movements in CPI and the personal consumption expenditure metric that the FOMC uses. But um, PPI inching up can to be ex really very good news. Many are saying this is the beginning of um, uh, the bottoming of this inflation. That means we are now going back uh, to inflation. We'll wait and see what we also get from the University of uh, Michigan's Consumer Sentiment Survey for, for August, which will be out also uh, shortly. But um, I think it's still looking pretty mixed and uh, traders are trying to uh, decide exactly what to make of this. But this week is likely uh, to end uh, on the back foot uh, for most of the indices. Well, buddy, thank you. Uh, and hold on for uh, with us for a little while as we take on some more business stories and come back to you shortly. Britain's economy expanded slightly over the second quarter, and this is thanks to the strong output in June and despite inflation remaining high, official data showed on Friday. Gross domestic product grew 0.2% in the April-June period after output expanded 0.1% in the first quarter. The official uh, office for national statistics had set this on uh, in a statement. The economy grew by uh, stronger than expected 0.5 percent in June, sending the pound higher against the dollar in early London training. While the market mostly shrugged off President Joe Biden's move to prohibit some U.S. technology investments in China, U.S. investors said they were worried Beijing will retaliate or pull back from buying American technology, aiming to protect national security and prevent U.S. capital and expertise from aiding China's military modernization. Biden this week issued an executive order barring some new U.S. investments in China in sensitive technologies, including computer chips, while regulating others. 
In commodity markets, European gas prices have been jumpy on the prospect of a strike on Australian gas fields. Chevron and Woodside are in talks with workers over pay and conditions at facilities that supply about 10 percent of the world's liquefied natural gas. Brent crude futures looked to end the week steady at uh, close to $87 a barrel. PwC Australia's attempt to remove a partner after an internal investigation into the leak of confidential government tax plans hit a roadblock today after an Australian court ruled the professional services firm failed to follow due process. One of the partners named Richard Gregg filed suit and claimed PwC did not provide him with sufficient reasons to remove him from the partnership. In the media release, PwC said his actions failed to meet professional responsibilities without elaborating. Kuwait has announced an outright ban of Barbie, Greta Gerwig's pink-hued blockbuster, saying the film promoted ideals and beliefs that are alien to Kuwaiti society. Lebanon's culture minister also demanded a ban, saying the Barbie movie contradicts religious values and morality and promotes homosexuality and sexual transformation. Meanwhile, Oppenheimer, the World War epic, is also struggling to open in Japan, where critics are also displeased. The U.S. Supreme Court has put on hold a $6 billion bankruptcy settlement by Purdue Pharma that will shield members of the Sackler family that own the company from future lawsuits linked to the U.S. opioids crisis. Purdue Pharma, which made the powerful painkiller Oxycontin, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in New York in 2019 amid a wave of litigation of its role in the opioid epidemic that has killed almost one million people in the U.S. However, members of the Sackler family who own the company never filed for bankruptcy. British homeware and household goods giant uh, retailer Wilco said it had fallen into administration on Thursday, putting its 400 stores and 12,500 jobs in danger if a buyer cannot be found. The family-owned retailer sought protection from creditors after failing to secure emergency funding, having suffered a cash squeeze following a downturn in trading. Country Garden, which is one of China's biggest property developers, has warned that it could see a loss for the first six months of the year of up to $7.6 billion. The announcement is the latest sign of the major issues faced by the world's second largest economy. This week's official figures showed China had slipped into deflation for the first time in more than two years. Exports have also fallen sharply while youth unemployment is at a record high. Shares in country garden holdings were down by almost 10% in Hong Kong trade on Friday morning. The U.S. Treasury Department will soon post, uh, propose a rule that would effectively end anonymous, uh, end anonymous luxury home purchases. Now, closing a loophole that the agency says allows corrupt oligarchs, terrorists and other criminals to hide their ill-gotten gains. The long-awaited rule is expected to require that real estate professionals, such as title insurers, report the identities of the beneficial owners of companies buying real estate in cash to the Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. KKR & Co. has signed a memorandum of understanding with Italy to include the government in its 23 billion euro bid for Telecom Italia SPA's network as Rome pushes to retain some oversight of an asset it deems strategic. The U.S. private equity firm signed a preliminary agreement with the economy ministry that could give Italy's treasury as much as 20% in the former phone monopolies network business. For more on the stories, let's now cross back to London, where Arise business analyst Bode Oshosomi is standing by. Now, Bode, first on the U.K. economy, we just got a raft of GDP and industrial production data. What more can you tell us? Well, clearly the, the data was uh, somewhat um, divergent from the mood, cost of living crisis and all the issues. Many had thought the UK, UK economy would either stagnate or maybe even go down slightly, but um, definitely it raised, this data raised hopes that Britain can indeed avoid a recession 
and uh, we saw the pound initially go up quite strongly in the morning and give up some of these gains uh, zigzagging as the, the dollar also picked up after that um, uh, the, the uh, PPI data where many are concerned again uh, that um, maybe the, the Fed may remain somewhat uh, hawkish for, for longer. But um, having said that, the, the growth that we are talking about in the UK comes despite a sequence of 14 consecutive interest rate rises by the Bank of England as they're trying to bring down inflation, which stands at 7.9%. Uh, and um, the other thing, of course, is that the, the economy bounced back from the effects of May's extra bank holiday to record strong growth in June. Also, uh, there was better, we had better weather conditions. And the many of the indices that were usually sluggish, like cars and pharmaceutical industry, saw decent uh, growth. I think this, of course, spoils the possibility that the Bank of England will probably continue to raise interest rates uh, to keep uh, inflation down. Remember, they've increased the base rate to 5.25%. Uh, uh, so although the economy is on track to avoid technical recession, it's just barely above uh, zero. So it's not a hugely positive um, result, but barely better than expected. But good news came from industrial production. Uh, data released by the National Statistics and here in the UK say that the, the, the measure, measure for industrial uh, production for June came out at 1.8% month and month, better than uh, what we had in, in May, which was minus, uh, May was minus 0.6%, and again, higher than 0.1% expected. Industrial production year on year rose 0.7%, uh, in, in June, recovering from a downwardly revised 2.1% uh, fall in the previous month, beating expectations of a 1.1% uh, drop. So 0.7% plus better than minus 1.1%. So there, there are, I would say there is good news if you look at some of the uh, other data coming out of the UK. Of course, everybody is focused on Wilco. That's the UK homeware giant uh, that entered into administration yesterday with 12,500 jobs uh, at risk. So it's, the times are really uh, somewhat uh, difficult. All right, buddy. And what else do we know about this KKR bid from Telecom Italia? Well, KKR has been trying to put some cash into this um, utility that has been uh, bleeding of cash. They have a huge debt uh, pile. Obviously, they're in desperate need of some infusion of capital, which the government doesn't have. So th there's this 23 billion uh, euro deal uh, bid for the former uh, phone monopolies and network. KKR is, is obviously smart to try and strike some compromise with the government because Rome holds the right to veto this deal involving strategic assets. And given you are talking about 40,000 employees in, in the Telecom Italia, they consider it very strategic. Uh, so doing a deal with the government also uh, solid, solidifies chances of pushing the deal and frustrating uh, efforts of uh, the largest shareholder, the Vendi SE, to frustrate uh, the sale. Georgia Meloni, she's coming quite aggressive. I, I just say, remember, she introduced uh, this uh, windfall taxes. And just as we're recovering uh, from that, she's now investing heavily, moving into telecom and trying to do something uh, there. But uh, I think the bottom line is when government wants to play the role of regulator and player at the same time, you tend to get an unsustainable situation. Governance uh, tends to be hurt. It, the play is not as competitive as it could be. So we'll, we'll see how this um, uh, evolves. Telecom Italia shares rose as much as 5.6% in Milan uh, yesterday. Uh, it, it's still up to date, but not as much uh, as that. But um, uh, I think this is something that's still uh, going to develop. Uh, we'll see exactly the impact th this um, government participation has on this unusual uh, marriage. So, buddy, what is the latest on global tech stocks and the future outlook for big tech in 2023? now that we have seen Q2 financials? Well, the big bet so far, if you ask um, investors, they say it's still on the NASDAQ, the new technology plays, AI and so on, for want of anything uh, else. But if you look at um, the, today, for example, 
um, the ETF that focuses on, on uh, NASDAQ, that's QQQ ETF, is down 2. Point, uh, is down 0.79 percent. Amazon is down 0.64 percent. Meta is down 1.18. Uh, percent. Nvidia is down 1.93%. Uh, Google is also down 0.82%. Apple is down 0.34%. Microsoft is down 0.85%. Tesla down a whopping 2.38%. Uh, so the, the NASDAQ actually crashed below its 50-day uh, working average, moving average, sorry, for the first time since uh, since March this week. That puts it on track for its worst stretch of losses uh, since uh, December. Also last week, the popular NASDAQ 100 uh, QQQ, that's the, the index I just read, that is down 0.74% uh, down, also uh, went uh, down below its 50-day um, uh, moving average. So we're seeing these trends uh, that uh, suggest that um, things are not so well with the so-called Magnificent Seven. That's Apple, Meta, Tesla, NVIDIA, Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft. They've all closed below their 50-day averages this week. Many believe the NASDAQ is going to close, is going to shut down, uh, maybe down 5% this week. So why is all this happening? I'll just very quickly run through my initial thoughts. Uh, Fed President Mary Daly said today that the Fed still has more work to do to tame inflation. Treasury yields went higher as a result of that, putting more pressure on stocks, especially the big tech names that are particularly sensitive to interest rates. Secondly, the narrative on AI, digital commerce, virtual reality, the new big bets are coming across as more mixed rather than uh, a more bullish uh, certain uh, narrative. And I think it's driving more caution than optimism. We also see a rebalancing of the NASDAQ away from big tech. The seven stocks with the heaviest weightings in the NASDAQ are seeing their collective weight being reduced to 44% from 56%. This implies that if you don't see a broadening of the rally that we saw in H1, the NASDAQ will see a drop. And then, of course, the U.S. ban on technology investments in China and all the um, well, the Cold War in that space. Clearly, Beijing is going to have to do something to retaliate. And uh, it's easy for them to pick on an apple or make things difficult for some of these uh, big tech players. And the rising and to merger and to big tech regulatory mode is also something uh, to, to watch. My sense in conclusion is that even though more than a few hurdles would have to be scaled. The, the financially buffered larger big tech uh, plays uh, with diversified business models will come up mostly intact. But the smaller, narrower, more vulnerable plays uh, may sink in, in, in the shakeout, especially in Q4. In short, we could see more of a divergence in fortunes, even though everybody still says big tech is, is the place uh, to be. Well, that seems to be the case. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, of course, Bodeo Shosami.